I want to talk to you out of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 6. It's a wonderful passage of scripture. Amazing miracle. One of those miracles that you that you just love to read about because it's so peculiar. 2 Kings chapter 6, starting with verse 1. And it says, And the sons of the prophet said to Elisha, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan, and let every man take a beam from there, and let us make there a place where we may dwell. So he answered, Go. Then one said, Please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down the trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water, and he cried out and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. So the man of God said, Where did it fall? And he showed him the place. So he cut off a stick and threw it in there, and he made the iron float. Therefore he said, Pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and took it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the move of your spirit this morning, Lord, for what you've done in this time together already. Lord, we know where two or three people are gathered together. There you are in the midst. But God, you showed up this morning in a special way, and we're thankful for that. God, now we ask that you would speak to our hearts through the preaching of your word in Jesus' name. Everybody said, let me begin with a question. How many of you are the kind of people who fill up your gas tank when it's half full? When that thing reaches half, you're the kind of person that you want to go to the gas tank. All right, I see Joe Brennan, I see Lenique. All right, a few of you are kind of crazy. Uh, No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Yeah. Now, how many of you, you're the quarter tank people? You don't want it to get below a quarter of a tank. A few more, a few more. All right, all right, that's wise. Now, how many of you, you're the gas light people? When the gas light comes on, that's when you finally do it. Now, how many of you, you know how many miles you can go past the gas light? Like whenever you see the fuel range and it says 50 miles, you, you, you know by experience you can really go 60. Now, just to let you know, you're the kind of people that we see standing by the side of the road. <laughs> now, I've actually, I've actually uh, run out of gas one time in my life. And that was right here on Red Oak near Green Oak. I was right by the church. We were doing some stuff and I had been uh, running some errands and come back and, uh, and I run out of gas. Here, here's my problem with run, in that moment was if any of you know me on a personal level, you know that I like to joke and pick a lot. And so I call my wife and she thought I was joking. So I had to spend some time just convincing her that I wasn't playing some kind of trick on her to actually come and help me out. Come on, how many of you are known for playing jokes? And so finally she does come and, 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 and pick me up and we go to the gas station, get, fill up, and I go on my merry way. But, but I can tell you that standing on the side of the road, even though I was in a familiar place, I was in a, 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 a place within walking distance of the church. It was not fun being stranded on the side of the road on empty. Now, it's even worse if you are, if you are on a trip and you run out of gas. Nobody wants, nobody plans for those moments. Nobody desires to run out of gas. But it happens all the time. And can I tell you that there are people every day who are living on empty. I'm not talking about living on an empty gas tank. I'm talking about living on an empty of a joy tank. They're living empty on the peace tank. They're, They're living empty in the strength that they need just to continue on in the everyday life. Every day there are people, and if I were to ask another question, probably some of you would say, I showed up here today on empty. That's why I came to church this morning. But can I tell you that in this world, there are things that just suck the life, suck the peace, suck the joy out of us. It drains us. It makes sense then why the Bible would say that in in the Holy, the the Bible says it's righteousness Joy and peace in the Holy Ghost is the kingdom of God. 
And so if we're kingdom citizens, then we should walk in righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. But let's face it, every day there are things that come our way, situations at work in our family that just seem to try to deplete us of the very thing God said was for us. The very thing that he provides for us as his children is the very thing that the enemy is trying to drain us from. And this is kind of what we see in 2 Kings chapter 6. We see a moment when, when things are going great for Elisha. Now we remember Elijah was the protege, Elisha, excuse me, was the protege of Elijah. He was the one that the Bible said he would literally pour water on the hands of Elisha. He was Elijah's servant. And now he, he has received the mantle of Elijah. He has taken on the ministry of leading the, the, the sons of the prophets. Now let me tell you what the sons of the prophets would really be better described for in our, our day as a school of prophets. This is where the young men would go who felt like they were called into the ministry. And Elijah would train them in, in, the, in the word and and how to hear the voice of God, how, how to be a prophet to Israel. And in this day and age, in this moment, under Elisha's direction, this ministry was growing. It had grown so much, so many young men were added to this place that they were having to build a new place for them. Where they, had li- where they were living would not, would not house the number of men that, were, that, were being, that were, had responded to the call of ministry. And so on all on all fronts it appears like Elisha is extremely successful he is growing his ministry he's walking in a double portion anointing uh, of what his predecessor had and things are going great and they are beginning to uh, embark on a building project and this building project no that they didn't have a lot of money so they borrow an axe okay They borrow this axe and they go down to the Jordan River. Elisha and some of the the sons of the prophets, they would call them. Some of these young men who had responded to the call of ministry. And they, they would go and begin to chop down the trees that they would use to build this new place. And in the process, they would lose the axe head. In other words, in the process... They would lose their edge. You see, when you lose your axe head, you can't chop too many trees. That's deep preaching right there. That is worth your offering right there. When, you see, when you live on empty, is a lot like losing your axe head. When you live on empty is when you lose your edge. It's a difficult place to be. It's not a fun place to be. And if you think about this, this happened while they were doing God's will. This happened while they were being faithful. So we need to do away with the idea that losing your edge means you've been, you're backslidden. Because it is possible to be doing the will of God, doing the work of God, but still lose your edge. It is possible to be praying but lose your edge to be to be to be walking for the lord but lose your edge because what happens is when you lose your edge you end up frustrated it's frustrating when you are driving down the road you run out of gas and you know it's your own fault come on you can blame somebody else come on we're really good at that but the, the, but if you run out of gas it's because you did not show up at the gas station now, I can tell you, I've, I've had those miracle moments. We were leaving a church in Laranger one time, and we, pre- we were out in the middle of absolutely nowhere between Laranger and Folsom, and we see that we're on, on empty. I was probably uh, 16 or 17 when this happened, and we begin to pray in that in that Dodge Caravan, my mom was driving, and we say, God, you've got to help us get to the gas station. And I can tell you that gas tank increased to over a quarter of a tank because God is able to fill your tank. Now, I know those miracle miracle moments are are wonderful, but but there's also a part of just working, just living, that just depletes you. They still had work to do, but they didn't have their axe head. They could not accomplish the task because they did not have the edge. 
You see, when you're living on empty, you can be doing the same motions. You see, they could have kept that, that uh, handle, and they could have continued doing the same motion, but they would not get any results. And that's what happens when we live on empty. That's what happens when we lose our edge. That we do the same thing as we used to do, but we lo- it loses its effectiveness. Have you ever been at a place in your life when you pray, but you feel like your prayers just hit the ceiling? You praise, but you just feel like your prayers, your praise can't get, go anywhere. Have you ever just gone through life? I'm talking about everyday life where you're doing the exact same thing you always did, but it just lose its effectiveness and the results you once saw, you no longer see. It's because you've lost your edge and you need to reclaim your edge. Hallelujah. You see, it's not surprising. Daniel chapter 7, 25 to be up there. It's not surprising. I shared this scripture on Wednesday night. It's really the end time. It's a spirit of the end times. That the enemy is trying hard to cause Christians to lose their edge, to live on empty. The Bible says, and he shall speak. Talking about the Antichrist. So, And we know the spirit of Antichrist is already here. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. That's me and you. So the enemy's plan is to wear you out. Come on, he does a good job of that sometimes, doesn't he? And in the Hebrew, when it says wear out the saints, that means to wear out somebody mentally, to attack them mentally. Where is the battlefield? It's in your mind. How is the enemy going to attack you? The first level of attack is always in your thought life. So he's doing whatever he can to deplete you of the strength that God has given you and promised you in his kingdom. And what we've got to do is recognize that the enemy's plan is to, is to stop us from living out our purpose and God's plan is to strengthen us for his purpose. So who am I going to give in to? Am I going to give in to the plan of the enemy or am I going to give in to the plan of God for my life? Am I going to live on empty, live in defeat, live in live less of the victory that God has for me or am I going to step over here in the victory zone and say, God, I receive of you today. I'm not leaving here empty. I'm not leaving my prayer closet empty. I'm not leaving this time in your word empty. I got to get the fullness of you for my life because I cannot leave my house until you give me the joy that I need come on I learned a long time ago that I should not leave my house until I prayed until I received some joy this world is crazy and so I, I realized I can't I cannot pass through this church I can't I could not even whenever I worked did not was not in ministry and I worked in the school system I definitely needed God to touch me before I showed up at that school because I was going to hurt somebody those kids are bad. And then I start pastoring, and sometimes the church people are just as bad. No, I'm just kidding. Not this church, not my other church. Um, and so I realized I can't pastor without joy. So I got to pray until I get some peace. Pray until I get joy, and then I get up and leave. And you've got to learn to do that. You cannot live your life without a daily walk with God. It is not going to work. You are, you are going to go crazy in this world with the enemy working the way he is. If you're not in a daily walk with God, you're going to end up crazy. It's true. You know I'm right. You're going to lose your mind. And so, <laughs> come on, how many of you already lost it? And, and let, let's face it, this isn't the first time in the scripture where somebody lo- loses their edge. You see, Elijah had lost his edge. After a contest on Mount Carmel, God moved powerfully. The glory of God filled the place. Fire fell on an altar. And just a little while later, he's running for his life from Jezebel because she had talked mad about him. Said she was wanting to kill him. We're talking about the guy, the guy that uh, against 300 prophets of Baal has said, has said, listen, you call fire down from your God and I'll call fire from my God and whatever one actually causes fire to start that's the one that's God and out of 300 prophets of Baal cutting themselves calling out to Baal nothing happens Elijah pours water on the altar and let and then God just licks it up with the fire of God listen that's the kind of miracle that just took place and now just a little bit later he's running from his life and sits under a tree called Orpah and would end up not Oprah Orpah and would end up saying God I just want to die Because he lost his edge. 
You see, because the voice of negativity in his life caused him to lose his edge. Sometimes, sometimes the voices around you will cause you to lose your edge. And you've got to recognize what is happening in your life and, and go to God. And this, then another person that would lose his edge was Samson. Samson was this powerful guy. He was a Nazarite. He had this strength that no one had ever had in all of history. He could just defeat armies and just by himself. He had this supernatural strength. But, of course, he would put his head in the lap of Delilah. And she would take his strength. By, of course, as the scripture tells us, his strength was because of his hair. Because of the Nazarite vow that he had taken. Cuts his hair. And would, in, and would end up losing his strength. Would end up blind and, and, and being a prisoner. He lost his edge because he fell into sin. Sometimes you lose your edge because of sin. Now, now I, I, I told you that backslide, losing your edge is not always, is not necessarily backsliding. But sometimes you have lost your edge because you have walked away from the wor word of God, okay? Uh, another person that would, would almost lose his edge was David. Now, he would almost lose his edge mentally. And he would say, I would have fainted had I not believed to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. You see, but he recognized what was going on. He recognized that he was mentally, he, he, I believe he wasn't necessarily speaking of a physical fainting, but fainting mentally. How many know you can faint mentally? You can just, you know, you're there, but you're not there. You're present, but you're not present. You're going through the motions. You're, you're going through your life, and it is just, you're, you have fainted. You have lost your strength. You've lost the wings of the eagle. The Bible says that you should walk in. You are, just, you are just going through the motions because you have lost your edge. But this is how you get it back. The Bible says, 2 Kings chapter 6, so it tells them that, but as they were cutting down the tree, the iron axe had fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. So the son of man said, Where did it? Fall. The first thing that you're going to have to do is you're going to have to stop avoiding and start and become aware that you've lost your edge. It's avoidance versus awareness. You see, as soon as this man noticed that the axe head flew off, he cries out in despair. But he had to notice before he cried out. And some of because the way the enemy works is that our strength is depleted little by little. And we're unaware that we've lost our edge. We just go through life and one trial after another trial. And listen, trials don't, it doesn't have to be a big trial. It could be the little things. You know, there's a scripture where it talks about that they, that it wasn't the battle that uh, actually caused them to uh, lose so many people in the army. It was actually the trees. It was being in the forest. The forest caused them to lose lose a lot of men just the being in that wilderness sometimes it's not the battles that you face that rob you of your strength it's the environment of your life if you live in a high stress environment you're stressed on the job stressed in your family stressed at stressed when you go to walmart lord knows that can cause a stress you watch tv and it stresses you out because our media is just enamored with negative information because there's something about humans that we just feast on the negative. We enjoy. Here, you know, you wonder why this election, because the media, likes, the media likes just creating this chaos so that you'll watch more. And so, somebody said, well, I'm not going to do political commentary. Let me get off of that. So of, we've got to become aware of what depletes our strength and aware that we're not, we're not walking in our full strength and that's really hard for us to do sometimes it is difficult because of the pride that we walk in to say I am depleted of my strength the Bible talks about ten virgins ten, five of them had their lamps full five of them did not fill up their lamps the, the five that did not fill up their lamps they would their lamps would burn out come on that's when you lose your head you burn out and because they didn't fill their lamp up with oil. And the Bible would call them foolish. And so if you don't recognize that you're losing strength, the Bible says that's foolishness. So I've got to be first become aware. I've got to become aware of the things that, that rob me of my strength. If there are certain people, like when you leave them, you feel depleted. 
I would be careful of myself around them. There are some situations that rob you of your strength. You plan your schedule around these things. If you know that you almost backslide when you go to Walmart, then you need to make sure you're prayed up before you go there. This is the way you, you become aware of it. The second thing that you've got to do is you've got to, you've got to start speaking. You can't just be silent about it. You cannot just, just be, be aware of it and do nothing about it. You see, you've got to take an action. And the first thing that he did is he cried out to Elijah. So he was aware of it. He noticed the axe had flew off. And then he said something about it. You've got to confess to the Lord that you are depleted of strength. The Bible, the Bible's full of it. If God, He loves to hear from His people. Ask and you shall receive. Confess your sins. The Bible's full. You speak out to God. You tell Him what you're in need of. You say to this mountain, be thou removed. God, God is always, for some reason, He's always placed in our mouth the method of miracle. Of our miracles. So if you want to receive strength, you've got to tell the Lord that you need strength, that you've been, that you're weary, you're dry, you're parched, and life has got you down. You've got to tell him what's going on. The third thing, because I just realized it's 1155. The third thing that you're gonna to have to do is you're gonna to have to then return. This is what the Bible says. So he said, Where did it fall off? And he showed him the place. He showed him the place. And so he reached out. His, and so he showed him the place. Now I lost myself in, my, in reading of the scripture. Showed him the place. And so he cut off a stick and threw it in there. And he made the iron float. So Elijah could have just said, well, there's nothing that we can do. I mean, really? You let the axe head fly off? You didn't tighten it enough. I don't know what they looked like back then, but I mean, you could just imagine they borrowed this thing. There's nothing we we can't afford to buy a new one. We couldn't afford to buy one to begin with. We borrowed this from somebody and just throw up his hands and walk away. No, Elijah said he developed a strategy. All right, show me where show me where it fell. Now this wasn't some little little ditch that it fell in. This is talking about the Jordan River. It's deep. This axe had floated to the bottom. How, how are they going to find it? But God gives him a strategy. He hears the voice of God and he, and he cuts off a limb and he throws it in the water and the axe head floats. What's the significance of this moment for you in your life is that you need to hear a word from God. You need to get in his word because you're going to find the strategy that you need to live a life of fullness from the word of God. That's what I taught you on Wednesday night, where it says, "Find rest." He said, "Be diligently that you find that you find this rest, so that you don't fall into temptation and walk in disobedience." For the word of God is sharp as a two-edged sword. That's Hebrews. And so, if I'm going, I, I need a word from God in order to walk in the fullness of God. But I also have to recognize there's a symbol because God always works in symbols. There's a symbol that He used a stick, He used a tree. Why is that? Why would that happen? Because we got to realize that the first is that there's got to be this confrontation with the divine. The, the, there was a tree involved. There was a stick involved. The tree that we need to run to is the cross. I believe that stick that was thrown on that water represents the, the cross of Calvary. When we get de serious about dealing with our issues, uh, being depleted, walking in, in, on an empty tank, we're going to run to the cross of Calvary where forgiveness and restoration comes. Then there must be a total abandonment of all, of all, of the, uh, of all trying on your own human power. It's not by might, it's not by power, it is by the Spirit. You see, he, they had to trust God. Throwing a stick into water makes absolutely no sense if you're trying to find something that just sank in the bottom of a river. I mean, really, are you, like next time, that, next time that you lose your remote in your couch, throw a piece of plastic on it. That, you know, that's the kind of thing that just happened there. <laughs> This is, not, this is not necessarily what makes sense in the natural. But it makes sense because he had gotten a word from God and the word works. And so when you are trying to live in the fullness 
instead of living on empty, then you've got to realize it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by His Spirit. You've got to get to the place where you, you recognize that you're seated with Him in heavenly places. You've got to recognize that, that you've got to just put it in His hand and trust Him. Walk in the trust that God is able to do it. So I'm going to be aware. I'm going to confess. I'm going to speak of my condition to the Lord. And then I'm going to receive the strategy from His Word and how to walk in the fullness of God. Can I tell you that you came here today. You came here today because you wanted to receive from God. And many of you receive from God. But it does not have to ha- you do not have to wait till Sunday to receive from God. And we call Wednesday night midweek fill up. You really don't have to, you don't really get it just on Wednesdays and Sundays. You've got, you've got to do this on a daily basis. Wake up in the morning and say, Lord, I need strength today. I need strength. You're aware that you need strength daily. I, I'm aware, Lord, I'm aware that I'm about to face this day and I need your strength, God. Now, how, how do you want me to face the day? And let me, You know what happens when you begin to live your life like that? He'll do it. He'll give you the joy you need, give you the peace you need, give you the strength you need. You do not have to live on empty any longer. And some of you, you're going to have to cut some, some things out of your life. Some of the things that stress you out, you don't really need in your life. Uh, I, I, come on. That, see, that's not good preaching. That, that's, that, that's, that's, too much like, uh, that's too much like telling you what to do, isn't it? You want to you hear you're seated with heavenly places. I, I realized a long time ago about preaching, people want to hear, hear the great promises, but they don't always want to hear how to get there. But sometimes there's a how to get there. And, and so in order, in order you to be seated in heavenly places, you've got to stay in the word. And when I'm seated in heavenly places, I don't allow the influence of the world to get into my mind. I walk in the freedom. I walk in the joy and I protect that thing. I protect the peace of God. Anyway, you can stand with me this morning as we get ready to, as we get ready to close. I want to pray a prayer for you today. I want to pray and declare in your life that you are no longer going to live on empty. No more. No more empty. No more fumes. No more just getting by. But you're going to live in the, in the righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost that He promised you. Because it is for you. It is not a far off. It's not just this crazy promise in God's word. There's a strategy for it, yes. But there's a promise that goes along that it is by His Spirit. See, He gives it. He'll give it to you right now. You leave here. If the news gets you up in an uproar, turn it off. And that's just the way it goes. Be, you've got to guard that peace. Guard it so that you could walk on full. This is just like in your vehicle. There are certain maintenance things that you have to do that allows you to get, get a better gas mileage. There's some things you got to do in your life to make sure that you get better gas mileage too. Let's pray. Father, I declare over this house that they are, they are full and not empty. They're the head and not the tail. They're above and not beneath. They are blessed. They're they're full of joy. They're full of peace. They're full of righteousness. The kingdom of God. They're walking in your kingdom. And they're walking in kingdom benefits. Lord, I thank you that they are no longer going to live on empty. But they will live on the fullness of God. Because it's not by might. It's not by power. It is by the Spirit of the Lord. Lord, we repent as your people for living on our own strength. Striving in the flesh rather than trusting in you. But today we take our seat next to you seated in heavenly places and we will guard the peace that we receive right now Lord fill us download it in our hearts right now Lord that we would leave here full full of your spirit full of your joy full of full of the Lord in Jesus name we thank you come on and bless the Lord this morning we thank you We thank you, we thank you.